the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. I would like to begin today by wishing all of you fathers a happy Father's Day. Uh, you will be remembered in a special way in today's Mass, and the same goes for all of the deceased fathers whose souls we especially remember today. The Gospel for this Sunday is full of rich symbolism and catechetical lessons. The Church today desires that we speak on the doctrine of papal infallibility. And this is because as our Lord was being pressed by the multitudes, he saw two ships, and he chose the one belonging to Simon and the future St. Peter, our first Pope. The fact that our Lord chose St. Peter's boat and no one else's is very important because as the church fathers tell us, this boat, this bark of St. Peter is a type or a symbol representing the Holy Catholic Church by the fact that our Lord was inside it and it was from it and from it only that the truth the words of salvation were spoken to the multitudes. There was no other teacher, no other preacher that possessed the words of eternal life. And this is where the church desires that we speak of papal infallibility, which is one of the most important dogmas of the Catholic Church today. Now obviously we cannot rate, really rate or grade one dogma over another since each belong to the same divinely revealed deposit of faith as the others. However, we can say that in our times, this dogma has furnished us with the certitude that we need to hold fast to our faith. The true Catholic faith in the wake of all of the horrible confusion and the heresies that the Second Vatican Council has caused which is also why the enemies of the church, mainly Freemasons and secularists, tried so hard to prevent papal infallibility from being defined by Pope Pius IX in the First Vatican Council in 1870. But regardless of their efforts and the terrible bloodshed that they caused for it, Pope Pius IX and the council were able to complete the dogmatic definition. Now here we are today, almost 150 years later, traditional Catholics, with 2,000 years of infallible church teaching to look toward and confirm our position of holding fast to the traditions as St. Paul instructed us to do. It is a sad reality that we live in a day that the greater majority of souls who believe themselves to be Catholic have been, in one way or another, deceived by the wolves in sheep's clothing that were given charge to protect them. Those who teach and promulgate the incredible heresies contained in the Vatican II documents and the subsequent teachings of the false claimants to the chair of St. Peter. Now there are some who, sit, who may sit, ask the question, how can I be so bold to say with such confidence that Vatican II is full of heresies? And these modern claimants of the papacy are illegitimate. Quite simply, it is because of papal infallibility. It is because we have the ability to compare what the church has always infallibly taught with the innovations of the modernists. Once we take the time to do this, the contradictions will be plain, glaring, and obvious. For example, concerning religious liberty, Vatican II teaches, the Council further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person. This right to religious freedom is to be recognized and the constitutional law whereby society is governed. Thus it is to become a civil right. Now, at the same time, the correct doctrine, which was authoritatively stated by Pope Pius IX in Quanticora in 1864, in which he says, 
And from this wholly false idea of social organization, they do not fear to foster that erroneous opinion, especially fatal to the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls, called by our predecessor Gregory the Sixteenth insanity, namely that the liberty of conscience and worship is the proper right of every man and should be proclaimed by law in every correctly established society. Each and every doctrine individually mentioned in this letter by our apostolic authority we reject, proscribe, and condemn. And we wish and command that all that they be considered as absolutely rejected by all the sons of the church. And in these two quotes, we find almost exactly word for word opposite statements. In his letter, Pope Pius IX not only teaches that it is heretical to hold such a doctrine, but he quotes, he quotes Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, who refers to such a doctrine as insanity. Now this is just one heresy of many that were taught at Vatican II, any one of which would de delegitimize the entire council. The clear contradictions that we find between the Catholic doctrine and the Vatican II teachings inevitably and automatically present us with an ultimatum. Either the Catholic Church prior to Vatican II is infallible and indefectible, which means that Vatican II is, if so facto, heretical, or, heaven forgive me for even suggesting this, that the whole Catholic Church and the whole Catholic faith has been a farce from the beginning, which would mean that our Lord was a liar, and the one who could never deceive has deceived, which obviously would be against logic, reason, and truth itself to believe. The truth is that I could go on and on about the errors of Vatican II and their consequences, which each and every one of us deals with on a daily basis, in our families, in our culture, in our society. But my goal today is to address the men of the parish, particularly the fathers. So the question I pose to us all is how many of us, in the light of what I have just presented, in the light of the incredible grace and blessing our Lord has given to us, are revealing these truths to us will kneel down before him, as St. Peter did today, declare his sinfulness, and, hum and humbly follow him. To be a loyal follower of Jesus Christ means to keep all his laws and doctrines. Fathers must set the example, because you represent Jesus in your home. You must be loyal to the laws of the church. You must represent Christ and give the example of frequent reception of the sacraments. You must be a man of prayer. Let your family see you on your knees. Encourage your family to pray with you by your example and rule. Above all, you must practice true charity right in the family circle. Fathers, imagine if you were in that crowd today, listen to our, listening to our Lord preach. Could you imagine leading your wives, your sons, and your daughters to another ship? Look for another doctrine, because maybe it's easier. There'd be less opposition, which will always be the case when it comes to following Christ. When it comes to not being willing to compromise truth, you will be despised by the world and the worldly. This is a promise of our Lord. However, he reminds us to have consolation that when it does hate us, because it had hated him first. But this is what a good man and a good father is willing to accept and endure for the sake of Christ, and for the sake of those that God has entrusted to his care. A true man will not be found without his rosary in his pocket, but more importantly, the love of our Blessed Mother in his heart. 
Real men do not subscribe to the foolish notions of manhood presented by the world. The idea is that somehow being confident means being a ladies' man, or that being strong is some sort of macho idea. Because these false are false ideals, and in most cases are masks covering insecurities and weakness. Manliness is measured in virtue, chivalry, selflessness, courage, chastity, purity, and kindness. Men, remember, if you do not practice these things, how can you possibly pass them on to those who are under your charge? Or how will it be possible to inspire your home, especially your boys, to be holy and godly men? How will you teach them the importance of religion if it is not the first priority in your home? If you are not engaged in their religious instruction, reading to your children sacred scripture, stories of the saints or other spiritual books, catechism, teaching them to love and serve God. How can you teach them diligence if you yourself are being lazy at home? In the late 19th century, there was a wonderful family and a wonderful father that is an example, and I would like to read some of his history and his, his story to you. This is the father of St. Therese, and he had five daughters, all of which became religious sisters. One, St. Therese, as most of us know, all of us I'm sure know, St. Pius X referred to as one of the greatest saints of modern times. His name was Louis Martin. Now Louis was spouse and parent. He knew that his first duty of a good father was to be a good husband. Zelly, his wife, wrote about him. I was always very happy with him. He fills my life with tenderness and sweetness. My husband is a very holy man, and I wish every woman had a husband like him. And later, our feelings were always in unison, and he was always my support and my consolation. As a father and master of the house, he gave his older daughters the responsibility of running the household and teaching their little sisters in imitation of their beloved mother, who had passed away. He spared nothing to develop their talents, procuring art lessons, and supplying the give, and giving them every advantage in his power. Now, Louis Martin was a brave man. As a boy, he belonged to a boys' military club. Exercising regularly, he grew into a tall and vigorous man. He swam well enough to save several persons from drowning. He saved trapped persons from fires. And he was so courageous that on the streets that if he was out later than usual, his daughters, daughters would be worried that he might be badly injured while trying to separate men who were fighting. As a father, Louis created a disciplined structure for the daily life of every member of his family. In all types of weather, they attended Mass together. The children had to eat what was set before them. The girls hardly missed a day at school. In eight years, Celine was absent only two days. He did not like to see them idle, and he encouraged them to develop various hobbies. And when he was left as a single parent, he became both father and mother to his daughters, who said, Our father's affectionate heart was enriched the truly maternal love for us. In many days he escorted the girls to and from school, listening patiently to the accounts of their days. Every evening he joined them after supper in the little salon, making toys for them, singing to them, telling them stories, reciting poems, and playing games before the family prayers. Louis had a profound respect for the spiritual lives of his daughters, and he not only gave them the greatest freedom to fulfill their vocations, but actively supported them in whatever they found God asking of them, allowing the Creator to deal directly with the creature. He undertook journeys and expenses to allow them to make retreats and consult their spiritual directors. 
at a time when many men became furious if their daughters wanted to enter the convent, sometimes even preventing it, Louis gave his consent freely, and he donated large sums to the convent his daughters entered. When his oldest daughter, Marie, which was his favorite, confided her vocation to him, he said, Oh, but without you, I thought you would never leave me. Yet he gave his permission at once. When Celine, the fourth of his daughters, and the last aunt of the convent, told him that she planned to become a Carmel Carmelite after he no longer needed her care, he said, Come, let us go together to the Blessed Sacrament to thank him for the honor he does me in choosing his spouses in my home. If I possessed anything better, I would hasten to offer it to him. Therese said that the better thing that he had to offer was himself. When he became paralyzed and had to accept being cared for in an institution and later by his family, he surrendered himself completely and was deeply touched by their devotion. He said once to his brother-in-law, in heaven, I will repay you for all of this. You can see where St. Therese got her spirituality. He understood that his daughters were the children of God, who entrusted him with their care, and he had joined generously with his wife in the shared task to bring them up for heaven. Celine wrote of Louis' prophetic role in the spiritual breakthrough, which Therese received later, in granting her an incomparable father whose goodness was a first picture of the goodness of our Father in heaven. Our Lord was preparing her to penetrate more than anyone else into the mystery of the divine fraternity. Louis Martin offers to the fathers of today a new model of masculinity and fatherhood. Uniting his love for God with his love for his wife and his daughters, he understood the essence of fatherhood, that his role as co-creator of the souls of his children to glorify God did not end with their birth, but continued throughout his life as he accompanied them to give them birth in eternity. He was a father, as he often repeated, all for God's greater glory. Remember, saints beget saints. In the Martyrology, and in the lessons of the saints of the divine office, almost all of the biographies of the saints begin with, he or she was raised by devout parents. Now obviously this does not mean that one cannot become a saint if not raised by devout parents, because there are saints that weren't. But it certainly does mean that it is a lot more difficult. Our Lord wants to assist us in all of our vocations. And being a father, it's a very difficult thing, especially in the world today, when everything is teaching the exact opposite of what God wills for you. He wants to give us and to our families the power and fruits of his graces. But these can only be received if we obey him and ask him, just as St. Peter humbly did today. As the professional fisherman listened to the son of a carpenter, about where and when to cast his nets. It was this humble submission to Christ that would give the life and power to his vocation as apostle and future pope. So he will do likewise for us if we will give ourselves to him and for him. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.